Well, hi. I want to welcome you once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. We're starting a new series today. Uh, it's on the call to ministry. I think it's important, but then again, I think everything in the Word of God is important, uh, and, and I know that to be true. Before we start, let me just ask, Father, that you would bless our time. Lord, that your Son, Christ Jesus, would be exalted through the study of His Word, study of He who is the Word. And Lord, that everything that we talk about here would be led by your Holy Spirit, whom you sent to, to lead us into all truth. I rejoice in the fact that in your promise that you will lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I know, Lord God, that we need to be equipped with your Word. We need to be corrected and reproved and trained in righteousness through your Word, your the word that you breathed out and breathed life into us with. So, Lord, just, just guide us tonight. And, Lord, let nothing that I say be something that you would not desire me to say. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I am in the habit of saying, if you've watched any of our studies, that I expect, I anticipate, I encourage you to test the things that I say here. Check them out in the Word. I don't want anything that you believe to be based on my opinion, but on solely on God's Word. This is an important study. Uh, it's an important study because when we talk about ministry, I think that in the church today, in the body of Christ, we commonly think of ministry as a realm reserved for the spiritual elite much as it was in the time of Jesus in the early church with the Pharisees and Sadducees. But that's not the truth. What we are doing to today is a study of ministry in what should be normal Christianity. I encourage you to have a pen, pencil, paper, take notes. Uh, and if you have questions or comments or suggestions about the studies that we do here, don't, don't hesitate to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. All right, let's get right into this study on a call to ministry. I think a first importance is to understand this. When we talk about ministry, as I just got through saying, it's not the realm of the spiritual elite. All Christians have ministry. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And again, a little later on, in the 11th verse of that same chapter, he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. The key here is, but to each one, and distributing to each one, every Christian has a ministry. The Apostle Paul says here, without exception, the Holy Spirit calls and empowers each and every believer Every person saved by the atoning work of Jesus Christ into a work of service for the common good. We all have ministry. We have come to commonly think of what is uh, of ministry as being restricted to what is usually called the five-fold ministries. That too is a poor and erroneous understanding of ministry. Now, so you know what I'm talking about when I say the five-fold ministry. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, and said, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You see, those, those ministries that we th commonly think of as ministry, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they are there to equip all of the saints for their ministry. 
because every Christian has a ministry. Again, back in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30, he, Paul writes, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, and administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not gifts, have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? And all do not interpret, do they? So everybody doesn't have the same gifts, and not everybody is called to those particular ministries, but again, God works through everybody, each one as He wills. Those ministers, as I said, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're called to equip every saint for the work of service, so otherwise called ministry. That indeed is what ministry is, pure and simple, to serve. All ministry is about serving. That's what the word means, all right? Listen to this from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 20, I'm going to read verses 25 to 28. Jesus called them to himself, called his apostles, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercised authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen to this. This is from John 13. You remember at the Last Supper, Jesus bowed down before his disciples to wash their feet. This is an account of that event. Jesus said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. That's what he said. Throughout this thing, I'm going to throw in a little attitude check. I want you to stop and think about this. The call to ministry is a call to be a servant, a bond servant. When you think about ministry, specifically when you think about your ministry, understand that underlying whatever that ministry is, is your call to be a bondservant to the Lord God Almighty. Let's just take a look at it through this. It was Peter who made the biggest fuss about Jesus being a servant, who was willing to pay any price to serve the Father's purpose. Right? Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. Peter is rebuking Jesus Christ because of Christ's willingness to go to the cross. And then Peter said to Jesus, remember we just talked about washing the feet? When Jesus did that, Peter said to Jesus, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash my, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. It was Peter who was first called to be an apostle. So, I mean, here's Peter, who is literally making the biggest fuss about Jesus' 
ministry of serving. But it was Peter that was first called by Jesus. What was the ministry that Jesus called him to? Well, let me read from John chapter 21. You can follow along with this. Make, make little notes and write this down and go check it out. John 21, verses 15 to 19. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my sheep. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying but what, by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. The first question Jesus asked him, do you love me? Established the single most important factor in any ministry. Your personal relationship with the Lord. Every ministry is founded on your love of Jesus Christ, on your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will never serve in ministry for Him as He desires. Oh, He can use you. He spoke through a donkey, Balaam's donkey, you remember. But if you are going to have a ministry, we're talking about believers. Remember I started by saying, by the, we're talking about those who have been saved by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, then this has to be based, it has to be founded. The foundation of any, any ministry is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is important, all right? Remember, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Jesus, who said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? said that this is the foremost of all commandments. Everything has to start with your own personal love of the Lord God. Think about what Joshua said. This is from Joshua 24, and I'm, I'm sure that you've heard it before. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua said to the people of God, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him. Him in, in, in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the God, gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You will always serve somebody. And ministry is your choice to fully serve the Lord, as Joshua did. But I promise you, if you choose not to serve the Lord, you're going to be serving somebody. No man can serve two masters, but every man will serve one master. Okay. Remember I said the attitude checks? Think about this. Here's an attitude check. The call to ministry must be founded on your love of the Lord. That's what that is, is what has to motivate you and draw you into ministry. It has to be what stabilizes your ministry. It has to be what directs your ministry. And you do have a ministry. Okay. The commission that Peter was re received from Jesus Christ was feed my sheep. I want to first take note of the fact that Jesus makes clear that the ministry is to his sheep. At no time are they Peter's sheep. That, that may sound simple, but I want you to think about this. You see, God entrust, ministry is the Lord entrusting you with a gift that He has given you 
in order to serve him, typically by serving others. All right? Think about this David, a man after God's own heart, is what it says in 1 Samuel 13 and in Acts 13. David, a man after God's own heart, whom the Lord chose to serve his people as king, is first noted for tending his father's sheep. Right? Think about that. David, God saw him and called him while he was out tending his father's sheep. This is from Psalm 78, verses 70 and 72. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with the suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. The Lord God took a shepherd and gave him the ministry of shepherding God's flock. His people. He took Peter, a fisherman, and made him a fisher of men. It is not true that God used their skills, their talents, and their past to serve his purpose. Now, I want you to think about what I'm saying now, okay? It's not that God just used their background. It was that he had been preparing them all of their lives for his coming call. God will very much use what, what your skills are that you have. But you have to understand, it's not that he's choosing, okay, he's using what you had. It is that he had been preparing you all along for the call that he has in your life. Even before, listen, he knew you before you knew him. Don't ever forget that. It's, this, this is an important thing. Um, you know, it, it's, he, he had your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. And he formed you in your mother's womb, is what it says in the Word of God. So he had his hand on your life long before you were aware that there was a God. And one of the joys of coming to realize this is, first of all, that, that, in my own life, in my own experience, let me just share this with you. I got saved on my 36 years ago, I guess, 36, 37 years ago, a long time ago, on my, on my 33rd birthday. And it troubled me very much after I got saved, the fact that basically I felt as though I had wasted 33 years of my life. Because there were 33 years of my life where I did not know and serve Jesus Christ. But the fact is, if I share my testimony, my testimony starts at birth, because I almost wasn't born. Um, doctors wanted to abort me before my mother gave birth because of a, a medical problem. That didn't happen. God prevented that from happening. My mother lived and both I, and I lived. I had polio when I was a young child, when I was eight years old in a time when it was epidemic throughout the, the United States of America. And children were dying from it left and right. God, my mother went and prayed. God did a, a, a healing miracle in my life. Uh, I, I flew in the United States Navy. I've been caught in hurricanes at sea. I've been on board a plane. As a, I was part of the crew. Um, when we had an explosion on board and we thought we'd all die, God put his hand on me. And I looked back, and I knew all along that was the Lord, but I didn't acknowledge that. But now, in retrospect, when I look back, I can see that it was his hand. And while I didn't know him, he was involved in my life from before the time I was born. And it says in Joel that he will restore to you the years that were eaten by the wild locusts. That's what happened. God restored those years to me. He gave them back to me. He, he made me see that, yes, he was in my life, even though I didn't recognize it at the time. He had been preparing me. He used all of the things that I did in my, in my earlier life. Did he use the sin? Well, you know what? Uh, the sin taught me a lesson. It taught me how easy it is to sin. It taught me the cure for sin. The only cure for sin is repentance and turning and accepting the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross. So, yeah, I, I learned from it. But whatever skills that I have, uh, it's not that God said, okay, boy, I can use that. It's that he was, he was making those things happen in my life all the way along. And I want you to know, I want you to examine, you know, Paul says over and over, let a man examine himself. 
If you look back and think about it, whatever skills that you have that you can see as gifts from God, they were from God from before the time you knew what was going on. And now, he who is the potter, who has been shaping you, molding that lump of clay that you are, has been preparation for you to be what you are supposed to be, a bondservant of the Most High God. Okay. The call to ministry is always about the Lord's people and His kingdom. That's an attitude check. It's always about Him. It's always about His kingdom. Now, I want you to think about this. Okay? David, we just talked about him, a man after God's own heart, but his son Solomon. Solomon was gifted by the Lord with wisdom beyond compare. It says in 1 Kings chapter 3, God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall anyone like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. Yet, Solomon became the perfect, or, or imperfect, example of pastoral burnout. He forgot why God had so wonderfully equipped him. I'm going to read to you from Ecclesiastes, the writing of Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15, Solomon said, Then I said to myself, As is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, This too is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2, 15. Solomon said, Why have I been extremely wise? Well, God told him why he was wise. He knew he was supposed to know. But he forgot why God had given him the wisdom. To serve the people of God. I want to just give you some statistics on pastoral burnout in the United States of America. 13%, and this is recent, I, I, I've known this for a long time, but I went today and got these st statistics off the, uh, off the internet from a very reliable source. PastorBurnout.com, if you want to check it. 13% of active pastors today in the United States are divorced. One third felt burned out within their first five years of ministry. 40% of pastors and 40% of their spouses are suffering from burnout, frantic schedules, and or unrealistic expectations. 45% of pastors say that they've experienced depression or burnout to the extent that they needed to take a leave of absence for ministry. 75% report severe stress causing anguish, worry, bewilderment, anger, depression, fear, and alienation. These are pastors in ministry. Doctors, lawyers, and clergy have the most problems with drug abuse, alcoholism, and suicide. 1,500 pastors leave their ministries each month due to burnout, conflict, or moral failure in the United States. 1,500 a month. Think about what I just read to you from Solomon. I want to go on to a couple of verses ahead. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17. Listen to what Solomon says. Now remember, he had everything. God had gifted him not only with in, in wisdom beyond, in, you know, it was incredible, but with riches and honor. And he says, So I hated my life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. He says he hated, goes on to say, he hated the work of his hands. Talk about burnout. So, so why? How did the world's wisest man allow this to happen? 
The answer is in that same chapter of the Word. The chapter that God spoke through Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I'm going to read you verses 4 through 10. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also I collected for myself silver and gold, and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided myself male and female singers in the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. And then a few verses later, he's saying he hated the work of his hands. Everything was misery to him. Why? Well, think about what I just read. My works, for myself, for myself, for myself, over and over. Solomon had stopped focusing on the kingdom of God and was building his own kingdom. He had lost sight of what his ministry was and started to build for himself rather than the kingdom of God. The very problem plagues, this plagues pastors and other ministers all over, particularly in the Western world. All too many pastors are building their own kingdoms. We call them congregations rather than God's kingdom. All too many ministers are more concerned with building their ministries than with building God's kingdom. Remember from the beginning of the study, the gifts of God given for ministry were given for the common good, not for one person's, not for the ministers. I mean, I see pastors, I know, I understand all of the pressure that's on them. You know, the peer pressure. Because the su successful uh, pastors today seem to be measured by the size of the building, the size of the budget, and the size of the, how, you know, how many people are the size of the congregation. Well, by that measure, Jesus was a failure. By that measure, Stephen was a failure. John the Baptist was a failure. That's not the measure of success. The only measure of success in ministry is this, that at the end of the day, when all is said and done, you hear from the Lord God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the only measure of success. And if God used your life to touch one other life and bring him into the kingdom of God, your life and your ministry would be worthwhile. If God calls you to go out and share the gospel and share the word and share the love and power of Him, and every man rejects you, but you're being faithful to the call of God, you will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We're not supposed to measure success like McDonald's does. It's not a matter of one billion served. It's not a matter of the numbers. It is a matter of faithfully obeying and fulfilling the call of God in your life, regardless of the consequences. That's not between you and them. That's between them and the Lord. Okay. And the same way you don't have to worry about being, you know, that you don't meet the standard. You, you also, you're not required, to, you know, to have, it's not about a box score. Okay? It's, it is just that faithful serving of the Lord. Let me give you one more attitude check right here. John the Baptist's words. I must decrease that he might increase. It's not about you. It's not about your ministry. It is about God's kingdom. That is not a pleasant thing in the world because that will not gain you the respect and honor of men. But that's why Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he said, Study, be diligent, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. You don't need to be approved by men. You need to be approved by God. And this call to ministry, let me tell you this, it's not about a job. It's not a job. All ministry is a calling, not a job. It must be, in the truest sense, a vocation. Now the word vocation 
actually comes from the from the Latin word vocare, to call. It's, it's kind of like a military draft. You know, you get called into service. You get called. And like the military, remember Paul saying, no man, no soldier on active duty entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. Like the military, it is a call to be willing to lay down your life. Think about these words of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. I'm going to read from John, John chapter 10, all right, starting in verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling, a hired hand, and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. The call to ministry is a call to lay down your life, whether it's physically or just spiritually, that you surrender your life to serve God, that you put others above yourself, the needs of others above your own needs, the concerns of others above your own concerns. That's laying down your life. And Jesus said no man, nobody could follow him unless they were willing to lay down their life, to deny themselves. And again, this goes back to all men, because all Christians, he's talking about Christians, all his disciples, are all called to ministry. Now, listen to me. It's not a job. The Lord doesn't provide for our needs. and He promised to, to provide all of our needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But He doesn't provide our needs because He's paying us for doing our labors, for our ministry, but simply because we are the children He loves. I mean, you may have children and call them to do chores around the house, but if they don't do the chores, you're going to just... Uh, Kick them out of the house and not pay them anymore, or you know, not feed them anymore, rather. We're the children he loves. Ministry is a labor of love. Not, it's not a job. The difference between a shepherd and a hireling is this. A, a, a hireling works because he gets paid by the church. A shepherd works because he loves the church. It's, it's really that simple. All too often, people go into what is called the five-fold ministry because of the benefits. It becomes a job. It brings stability and security. It brings respect. But that's only if you do it wrong. Okay? Um, you know, there's some really strong examples of that. I come from an Irish Catholic background. And back in the time in the 1800s and the early 1900s when there was great emigration of Irish Catholics into the United States of America, it was because it was a potato famine in Ireland. And, and life was hard and difficult and, and oftentimes horrible. So when they came to the States, these deeply Catholic people saw one thing. You know, the priests didn't go hungry. They didn't ever have a time when they didn't have a roof over their heads. They were well cared for, they were well fed, they were well respected in the community. The same was true of the nuns. So it became commonplace that Irish families would send people into the girls into to the, to nuns and the boys into the priesthood. It wasn't because of great spiritual things as much as it was because there was security there, there was stability there, uh, that they didn't see any place else in the world. By the way, the Irish did the same thing with the police and fire department for exactly the same reasons. It's true, and I've seen this happen in a lot of ministries, especially ministries that minister to the, the lowly, the downtrodden. Um, and it's unfortunate that at times what happens is that those lowly and downtrodden come in and come into the body of Christ through the work of these ministries. But then what happens is they see the pastors of these, uh, these ministries or congregations, the heads of the ministries, who, uh, again... 
They're, they're well fed, they're well clothed, they have homes, they have nice cars. And a lot of times people, you know, that come into the body through that, they feel this call to go into, quote unquote, to go into the ministry because they are attracted once again by that stability, by that security uh, that, that seems to be there. Not because of a desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, which is a path of self-denial, of dying to oneself, of denying oneself and picking up your own cross and daily following Jesus Christ. It's something that we have to be on guard for. Okay, remember that the Pharisees, they were rewarded for their, their religious service, their ministry. They, re they were rewarded with honor and praise on earth. And they received the reward in full. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 1 and 2. He said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father. Who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. There are people involved in ministry who are doing what they do for that recognition by men, for the honor from men, for the rewards from men that you receive here and now. And God says, that, okay, you have your reward in full. I don't want to work for that reward. I want to work for that reward that comes, that lasts for an eternity, not for some part of a lifetime. So Jesus said, that we're to, when you, we are to count the cost. If anyone comes to me, he said, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid down a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. That's Luke 14, verses 26 and 30. When Jesus chose and sent out the twelve, he sent them out after instructing them, saying, You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. Remember what we saw earlier with Peter, right? When the Lord described his ministry to him, and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself up and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. John 21, verses 18 and 19. Uh, this is what Jesus told Peter. Okay, you're going to go out and serve. Here's the consequence. Here's the cost. When he called the apostle Paul, remember Saul of Tarsus going to persecute Christians on the road to Damascus. He spoke to uh, Ananias who would then lay hands on Paul so he would regain his sight, remember? In Acts 9, 15 and 16 it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Well, I'd say that's not a great recruiting tactic for, for a call into ministry. Uh, but that is the call to ministry. And again, he said, none of you can be my disciple. This is for each and every Christian. For every one of us. Every one of us has a ministry. And for every one of us, there is a cost. And the cost is the denial of self, the loss of self, that we serve God by serving others. Remember he said, for what you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Time for another attitude check. Serving Jesus will not come without cost. You better have these things in your mind. Because if, if, if by you know, having a call to ministry you think that this is about exalting you, you're wrong. Now, it says that we are to give honor to whom honor is due. And, and those who are preaching the gospel should receive double honor. 
But there's a, re there's a difference here in the work between receiving honor from being a faithful servant and being exalted. Christ gets exalted. We can get honored, but I tell you, it better be Christ that gets exalted. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. We have to point all of the glory and honor go to the Lord. All of the glory goes to God. When Abraham refused to accept the reward from the world, the king of Sodom, the Sodom, the Lord spoke to him and said, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham and Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram, for I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Genesis 15, 1. There is a reward. Yes, there's a cost. But there is a reward. It says in 2 Chronicles 15, 7. But you, be strong and do not lose courage. For there is a reward for your work. Listen, God is just. He's fair. There is a reward. But it's not... You don't want the stuff that the world has. You want the things that God has to give you. That faithful Lord. That's why it says in Matthew 5, again in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 12, it says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For This is about the paying the cost. For those, in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You guys will be, you'll be persecuted, but your reward in heaven is great. There is that reward, that honor, that glory that will be coming. That's, that's for sure. You know, it's just... I said, you know, it's like we, we have to have this ability to understand that Christ is calling us to die to ourselves, to lay down our lives, to serve others. You can't be concentrated and focused on doing what is best for you at the same time, you're figuring what's best for somebody else. And that's ministering to them. But Jesus said in Revelation 22, here at the end, He said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. He's bringing that reward. At the end of the day, you're going to have that. But remember, we talk about the cost and we talk about reward. It says that Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before Him. It says that in Hebrews 12 too. So again, Here's one more attitude check. Serving Jesus will not come without great reward. Hallelujah. That's why, that's why it says in Psalm 102, Psalm 100, verse 2, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. The call to ministry is supposed to be a joyful thing. It should light up your life. It's a wonderful thing. But you have to understand that the foundation of this is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that there is a cost. Listen to what I'm telling you. I've, I've said at the beginning of this, every Christian has a ministry. I have gone into, if you've been following our Bible studies and our Bible bites, you, you have probably heard me say this before. I have gone into churches all around the world and said to a large congregation, I've gone into past this conferences and asked the same question. How many of you here believe that God wants to bless you just as much as He possibly can right now? And inevitably, without fail, every hand in the place shoots straight up. And then I tell them, well, you're going to have to repent of that. Because you're wrong. If God wanted to bless you as much as He possibly can, and I'm speaking to every believer, what He would do is, boom, you would drop to the ground dead right now. Because as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. There is no greater gain, there is no greater reward than to go, to leave this present world, to leave this present life, and to go and be in the very presence of God, in the throne room of God, in the heavens. That's the reward that awaits us. And if God wanted to bless you as much as He possibly could, boom, He'd take you right now. But He hasn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this right now. So why hasn't He? Because He has a purpose for your life right here, right now. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You have a ministry. You are the one who brings the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place right now. You are the one who goes into the world. You are the one who is to bring the love, the glory, the power, the word of God into all places. We all have that ministry. Your ministry, listen to what I'm going to tell you now. You may not be part of that fivefold ministry, as I said. You may not be an apostle. 
You may not be a prophet or a pastor or an evangelist, a teacher. You may be a plumber. If you are a plumber, a born-again Christian who is a plumber, then that's your ministry. And you need to be trained and equipped to do that ministry in a godly, righteous fashion that serves God's purpose for you here on earth. And remember, His purpose is to build His kingdom, to build His church. So, over the course of our study here, that is what we are going to do. We are going to have a course on ministry to help everybody be fully equipped for the work of service, for the work of serving our God, our Lord, our Master, our Teacher, following His example of being a servant, following His example of not seeking to be served, but to serve. And that's what we're trying to do here at Bible Talk. So, in our next, next get-together here in, in the following week, we're going to continue on for a couple of weeks here just looking at the call to ministry, what it truly means to be called into the service of God. And again, let me leave on this note. If you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you have been called to ministry. If you don't know what that ministry is yet, praise God, I, I pray that we will be able to help you to hear His call in your life. Because it's not going to be me who tells you what to do. And it shouldn't be any other man that tells you what your ministry is. That call should be coming to you from on high. And that's what will bring joy into your life. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you still choose to use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. That you can still use our weakness, that your, your strength would be perfected and shown into the world. Lord, that you don't call the greatest, you call the least, over and over and over. You called David, who was the least of the, the sons. You called Israel, who was the least of the nations. You've called me the least of all men, Lord God, because you desire to receive the glory. I thank you, Lord, that you don't call us to anything that you don't equip us for, that you will give us everything that we need to fulfill the tasks that you call us to. We thank you, Lord God, that you can and desire to use our lives for your name's sake. We just praise you and we thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, make sure you're back for the next part of this study. I believe it will probably be a three-part study on the call to ministry. And then we will go into more and more how do you fulfill the ministry that God has called you to whether it's standing behind a pulpit, or whether it's in an office building, or whether it's being a stay-at-home mom taking care of your children, each and every one of us have ministry. And we want to do our part to help you be equipped to fulfill it, filled with joy, and accomplishing God's purpose in your life. Until the next time, may God bless you and use you for the